Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and today's message with Drs. Dennis and Jennifer Clark brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its dedicated supporters. We are here to equip you with the how-to tools and practical effective ways for empowering your Christian journey. Join us as we explore teachings that bring healing through forgiveness and ignite transformation in both individuals and families. For more resources, join our mission. Visit us at forgive123.com. Let's embark on this journey together. Welcome, Kingdom Life Church and Full Stature Ministries, and uh, our partners that are out of state, that are knit together with us. They're going to take partake in the challenge. This challenge for the peace challenge is going to be for anyone who's already known enough of our material to know how to get the emotional healing that's necessary. The peace challenge without the emotional healing. With, would be very discouraging. <laughs> but our battle cry for the month of July, after we teach even some more on the peace challenge and peace, two more messages? Well, the peace challenge in itself is two months old, but it'll start in July. And for the survivors, we'll go the second month. Um, but the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. And why it's not emphasized, I don't know. But righteousness is love and action, peace, and joy. Do you realize those are all the God emotions? The fruit of the Spirit are the God emotions? And that's the kingdom of God. So if you can't live in the God emotions, what are you, what are you, you must have some kind of religion because what you're living is not Christianity if you're not walking in the, in the peace of God, the supernatural peace of God. So, We've covered several messages of Jehovah Shalom, uh, the militancy of, of peace and understanding that it's not passive, that peace crushes Satan beneath your feet. The God of peace is actually what Gideon uh, appeared to him. He, 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 he spoke that when the angel of the Lord appeared, God appeared to him, he appeared to him as Jehovah Shalom. That doesn't sound militant, but you know what? It is militant. And God isn't uh, confused about the words that he chooses for these scriptures that are inspired by the Holy Spirit. And if it says that God of peace will crush Satan beneath your feet, you want victory in your life, you're going to have to win the battle within before you win the battle without. So I don't know what you're going through. Everybody goes through stuff in this world. You'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Well, how do you overcome? Peace has to overcome. And the enemy can't control peace. The enemy can't penetrate peace. So I want to give some more information on peace so that we are without excuse when we start the peace challenge. You can't say, well, I didn't know that part. Okay, all right. You need to know this part. Um, peace is completeness, the word shalom, wholeness, peace, health, healing, welfare, safety, salvation, deliverance, soundness, tranquility, prosperity, perfectness, fullness, rest, harmony, absence of agitation or discord, total well-being, and as Bill Morford would say, all things intact, nothing's missing, and friendship. Now, if you don't want any of those things, just raise your hand and we'll pray for you in a different way. We'll get you delivered. All right. Now, this, uh, this teaching actually unfolded to me uh, many years ago when I kept looking at the, um, uh, I don't even know who taught it, but somebody taught the five-fold ministry, and they used the illustration of the hand. Have you ever seen that? Yeah. That when Jesus ascended, he gave gifts unto men. Uh, so they're not, you can't get to the point where you say, that's not necessary. I don't, I don't need apostles, prophets, pastors, and Evangelists and pastors, teachers. Then Jesus gave, ascended on high, gave these gifts to men for no reason, because uh, you don't need them. Or like the current trend now is, I am the church. I am the church broke free from the church as a building. Thank God for that. But you are not a corporate entity by yourself. So you need to be part of uh, the definition, ecclesia, is a church, is those who have been called out of the world in order to assemble. Isn't that interesting? So when you say you're the church, you're the part of the church as best as possible. You're a potential 
part of something, but that's up to you. Now, here's the thing. When they taught uh, fivefold ministers, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, um, evangelists, now, when they taught it, they would use the hand. They'd say, the thumb is like the apostle who touches all the other members. Apostolic authority. Then they said that this index finger is like the prophet. He points and guys say, thus saith the Lord, this is what you need to do. <laughs> the ring finger, I mean, the, uh, the middle finger extends beyond all the other fingers, and that represents the evangelist that reaches out beyond right? He goes beyond. The ring finger, that's the pastor who is married to the flock, to the sheep. He's to demonstrate, feed, care for, love the flock. Little finger is like the teacher. That's where the rubber meets the road and they get you grounded in it, okay? That's simple enough? All right. But years ago, I was, in, I was praying and uh, all of a sudden I said, you know what, five-fold ministers, they're functioning, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So I always like, God would always give me a truth, say, here's, how, here's the how-to, or here's the, I'm going to cultivate that truth, and then you see if there's fruit. So I was looking at that, the way all five-fold ministers were working, Jesus walked in all five, all right, unlike people. And so I said, it's the way God would work, the Holy Spirit would work through us as individuals. And I saw those same five Gs, if you want to call it that, apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, and teachers, they use the G word for each one. And I'm thinking, that's correct. The apostle, G word number one, governs. The prophet guides. The evangelist goes and gathers. <laughs> the pastor guards and the teacher grounds them in the basics, grounds them to where it's working knowledge, grounds them to where you're living the basics automatically. You become unconsciously competent. That's a walk in the spirit. You need the teachers for that. The teachers will sound repetitive like I heard that before. Yes, but has, do you own it? <laughs> Repetition is still one of the best teachings of a teacher you can have. Because guess what? You don't get everything the first time you hear it. That'd be like saying, I read my Bible once. What do you want from me? <laughs> I read it one time. All right. So those five G's, God began to unfold to me. Those five G's are consistent ways that God worked, even Jesus on planet Earth, but that's how he works now through the Spirit. On planet Earth, he was the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. He was all of those. But when he ascended, he distributed it so that the body, the ecclesia, the church would come together, which each part doing its share, working according to the gifting and the placement that he has in the body, so that they would become one vein, one voice, one mind, one love, one toward another, that oneness would include a diversity and teaching of people to love your differences. Everybody's not like you. Matter of fact, parents don't think you're going to turn your kids and live your life through your kids. You let your kids develop and be who God wanted them to be, not, not necessarily you imposing all the uh, things that you didn't get to do in your life, so you're going to make them do it. You know, that kind of thing. All right. So let's, let's start with that first one. And God showed me that the supernatural peace of God, I have more confidence in the supernatural peace of God than I do with all the reasoning in the world. And it's proven itself over the years, God's peace is more reliable than all of the reasoning in the world. And the, the illustration of the hand, 
I saw that this translated to the Spirit of God working through us as individual Christians, and those five G's applied to the Holy Spirit. And eventually, this is what the peace challenge will be uh, in the days ahead. But I want you to know everything possible about peace first. All right. I saw the Holy Spirit in me operating as the government. Where is that in Scripture? The Holy Spirit wants to govern. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government, there it is, will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now Jennifer teaches on that, uh, Sar Shalom. Uh, you, should, you should get that teaching too. Sar Shalom, it, Prince is actually downplaying it. Because if you think about it, it, it really it's, it's far more powerful. Sar Shalom is far more powerful than Prince. He's not an underling. Remember, Abraham gave paid tithes to Melchizedek king of Salem, king of peace. All right? Sar Shalom should be more of a king of peace, a ruler. He's not a subsidiary or, or sub, submissive to someone else, his authority. He's not second in line. All right, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. It's kingdom government. So I saw the Holy Spirit is saying that Jesus himself in me I'm under the government of voice, the Word of God. I'm under that government. The kingdom government for an individual believer is that you're under the government of voice or His Word. And His Word clearly says that His government, He's a king of peace. If He's the king of peace and the scriptures are let the peace of God rule, what's that saying? As an Believer, I'm under the authority of the king, King Jesus. I'm under the authority of the king of peace. How will I know if I'm doing what I'm doing is right? Peace. Remember, in this church, if you answer peace or forgiveness, you, you're going to be right 90% of the time. If you understand the supernatural impact or the supernatural exchange of peace and forgiveness, you're going to walk in the spirit. You're going to enjoy the Christian life like you've never enjoyed before. Because it's going to be reality over reality and relationship over religion, of which many people have settled for when they're when they can't find the niche of a true spiritual walk, they just settle for rules and regulations. But it is God who is at work in you to will and to perform. Uh, I, uh, Jim Gall once told us that we were like Thomas Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton, I like to quote him, in his writings, he talked about a romance of wills. That was the way he viewed Christianity, a romance of wills. It was like, my will and his will are dancing together. It's not this drudgery, it's not this lay down, get condemned uh, Christianity. It's really a romance of laying it down, but the greater one taking over. And knowing when that happens is actually... Uh, a, a life that transcends the normal. The, the, your mind, will, and emotions are subordinate to the king of peace. So you might not be an apostle. You might not even uh, believe there is such a thing as apostles nowadays, but which you're sadly mistaken, but I forgive you. Remember? Forgiveness. All right. But anyway, <clears throat> the, that fivefold influence has to do with dominion or rule. So whenever in your Christian walk you feel peace, guess who's ruling? Jesus. He's the king of peace. And you're in the kingdom, and he's ruling. When you lose your peace, he didn't go anywhere, you did. You got out from under that authority, but you can get back. That's the beautiful thing about the peace of God. The, the covenant that God made this is peace is forever, but it's also instant. It's available instantly, but you can also know that that kingdom covenant is forever. That's a plan. There's a life plan for you. You want to plan, plan your life out, plan for that covenant of peace that will never stop, that will never leave, will never quit, and say, that's me. 
If I get away, I get back instantly, but I'm never going to leave that kingdom. Like the children did with the children's book. What did, what did the one gets In the children's book, it talks about going from the world to God country. And we had the little kids go, I don't ever want to leave God country. I go, yeah, now if we get the adults to talk like that, uh, that would be the kingdom of peace, right? So the five Gs, I don't know if you took those notes on it, but I think it's important to see them. That, uh, <clears throat> that it <clears throat> governs, guides, goes and gathers, guards, and grounds. And the Holy Spirit wants to do that in your life to make your life real. So just like God has gave fivefold ministries with these explicit uh, attributes, those attributes come from God. God's got all of them. So a life in the Spirit, we should benefit from all of them. And quite frankly, <clears throat> a person with an apostolic anointing has a tendency to build. Build according to a heavenly pattern that God puts in his heart. Not every pastor is a builder or a church planter. But he'll have an ability to love the sheep and to teach the sheep to love. You've got the evangelist that his passion is... I'm in this church, but they're all saved already. I need fresh. I need a fresh. And that's in them, and it's real. Then you've got the pastor. And by the way, even pastors that don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit, I always got a kick out of that. You give me a good evangelical pastor, say, I don't believe in those gifts or not for today, blah, 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 blah. But you know what? If there's a wolf in their sheep, and a wolf attacking their sheep, they'll know it. They'll know it instinctively from the gut because it's part of the it's part of the calling of pastor. They'll know because their job is to guard the sheep. I can still remember who was it? Uh, uh, James Robinson, before he came into a fullness of the Spirit, he said he just couldn't justify. He hated to admit it. But when there was an, before there was an altar call, he knew who was going to come forward. But then his theology didn't allow him to know that. So he just dismissed it. And then, sure enough, those same people that I knew should come forward came forward and accepted Jesus. Isn't that funny? But they struggle. Your theology sometimes will shoot you in the foot until you finally say, God, if that's you, show me. All right. But anyway, so... This king of peace, this kingdom government. And I always like the scripture. This is what God would convict me of in order to make me move forward. He, he showed me that I had, I had you know, the heights, the width, the length, and the depth of the love of God. Oh, Dennis, you've got depth. You just love prayer. You spend more time in prayer. And there was people who wanted to copy uh, young pastors came to even copy my prayer life. And I thought, oh, that's wonderful. Oh, because you're deep. And then worship. Oh, you love to worship. You love to let it flow out of the innermost being without ef any effort. Seeing that the, one of the first visions I had was Jesus in me from head to toe, lifting his hands, worshiping the Father. And it, for me, Trinity was not a complicated concept. It was the three in one. But it was God in me manifesting as Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, worshiping the Father. I don't worship this way. I yield to this way. I enjoy, I relate, I enjoy reality, but I worship that way. You need to be an expression. Okay. Now, in that time where he was dealing with me on even the government of God, I saw... I had vision for the future, I had height, I had depth, but God said, your building's too skinny. God, what are you saying? I've got depth, victory over the devil. I've got worshipful heart. I love worshiping. I love praying in the spirit during the day. I've got vision for the future. God gave me a heavenly vision of which to, how to build a church when I didn't know how. Well, wait a minute, what's missing here? The height, the depth, and the length. Oh, the width. That's like when you go out and cut the grass and murmur and complain. Yeah, that part of your building is pretty skinny. So you, he wants a cube. 
That bride that comes out of heaven in the book of Revelations is a cube. The height, the width, the length, and the depth of the love of God are a cube. And God was saying, Dennis, you're like a skinny skyscraper, but a good storm will blow it over. I don't care how high, I don't care how well the foundation, I don't care how much vision you got. If you can't bring it into everyday life, what are you doing, playing church? So here's the scriptures he gave me, and hopefully this will help you. And he gave it to me over and over and over again. Two scriptures. Proverbs 25, 28, and Proverbs 16, 32. And this was addressed to Dennis. Let it be addressed to you. If it's good for me, it's good for you. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Think about it. You're like a city without walls. Because you don't have rule over your spirit, the enemy can come and run roughshod over your thoughts, your emotions, and your choices, whatever he wants to. Because you have no rule over your own spirit. Your flesh will rule, the world will rule, the devil will rule. But when you have no rule, peace is the only legitimate wall a Christian should have. Peace is the only legitimate wall. It's the presence of the king, his nature. He's impenetrable. He's a mighty fortress. He's a rock. But whoever has no rule over is, is like a city broken down without walls. So I saw that I had to change my attitude in the mundane things of life. I don't care if it's uh, cutting the grass, washing the dishes, do whatever. You do it as unto the Lord, and you allow him to recognize that you are a servant and that you're bringing him into all of life, not just church meetings. I'm bringing him into my being moment by moment, day by day. After all, sufficient is, even the warnings in the scripture, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So you better, you better make it a daily habit. Give us this day our daily portion of reality, that daily bread, the bread of life himself, that reality. Man doesn't live by that bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So if I were to look at the Lord's Prayer and say, give us this day our daily bread, it goes way beyond food on your table. He knows you have need of these things, but you need the rhema word. You need the, the, the reality of that word in you. Now, the other verse to beat Dennis up with, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit than he who taketh a city. You can see outward force of movers and shakers, and it still doesn't compare to the supernatural peace of God who is under the rule of God. The person who's under the rule of God, and one of the indications is slow to anger. I'll tell you what, they're few and far between, but when I've really lost my temper, I saw there was a powerful lesson immediately after, if you will stand the correction. Anger is you're actually mad at God. You know, we teach forgive God, self, and others. I think we don't forgive God enough. Yeah, he's in charge of those circumstances. And you don't want to hear about my kitchen sermon from Jennifer again. But you probably need it. She said, honey, the road is a microcosm of the kingdom. Come on, you should have this memorized by now. The road is a microcosm of the kingdom. Those are God's people. That's God's road. The kingdom of God is love, joy, peace. How you doing? How you doing on that road? Huh? But if you're upset, you're upset with God placed that person on the road right in front of you. The one going slow and you're already late. Mm -hmm. God placed it. You know what he was doing? He was letting you see what was in your heart. 
<laughs> How did it look? <laughs> okay, then get the rule back by receiving forgiveness and get your peace back. <sighs> All right? Huh? And pray for that person. It's, you know, when you see something crazy on the road, instead of getting upset or going, I can't believe they did that. Well, why can't you believe that? <laughs> it just happened. That doesn't take any faith. How about pray for them? Lord, keep them safe. Bless them. Who knows what they went through? They might have just got bad news from the doctor, you know, and their mind's not totally on it. you got to forgive them. And then again, they might have been looking at their stupid cell phone, and they don't leave that green light. Never happened to you, right? Bless them. Keep them safe, Lord. Keep them away from that phone while they're driving. <laughs> Or supposed to drive, either way, right? All right. You kind of get the idea of the government of God? Because this government of voice is what ruled, but God wants you to have the peace in the mundane. He wants you to have, like a cube, the height, the width, the length, and the depth of the love of God. He wants it to be balanced. Now, he who's slow to anger is better than the mighty. Anger is an indication that you don't like the way God's running his universe. You don't like the people that he put in your life. Oh, well, pardon me, King, King Dennis. Huh? So who made you general manager of the universe? And I told Jennifer, I, I've repented. I am not the general manager of the universe. I do find myself campaigning now and then. So we don't want to do that. All right. Don't campaign either. Say, that's not God. That, by the way, you'd be surprised how much trouble you could save yourself under the government of God. I'm going to get to the other G's here before it gets too long here. But uh, under, the, under the government of God and the fact that it's his, it's his kingdom, not mine, uh, that... Really, really, what he what he wants from us is so much. He he wants a relationship with us. I don't think that's sunk into a lot of Christians. He loves you so much. He wants a relationship with you. Why let that stuff interfere with that? I mean, the God of the universe, the God who created all things, including you, wants a relationship. We should be so honored that we humble ourselves before that King and say, this is the government of God that I belong to, and this is where I want to stay, in his, in his kingdom, his God country. What a privilege. I, you know, I struggled with that when I first got filled with the Spirit because I figured I was such a bad person. There were Christians that wouldn't pray for me. You know, <laughs> it was too hard. But at the same time, I was overwhelmed and cried for days when I said, he must really, really love his creation because with all my screw-ups and all my mistakes and all my sin, he still loved me. He would do that. Boy, that's the person you want to have a relationship with. That's the kingdom. That's the government you want to be under. That is not a threat to be under that government like you're going to be abused. You're going to be loved. You're going to be you're going to be filled with love, joy, and peace. Oh, if anybody doesn't want that, I mean, don't do it. Don't go to God if you don't want love, joy, peace. I mean, for heaven's sakes. I want to force something on you. All right? But this government is, is interesting to pay attention to your circumstances because if you get upset all the time with circumstances, you better start forgiving the judgment you made against God and the way he's doing things. Because he says, in this world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome. How do, how do I overcome? Peace. Peace. What peace does in Mark 4, 39. Do you remember Jesus got up and rebuked the wind and said, peace, be still. Very militant, by the way. That's not very passive. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. That means peace speaks. It speaks with your words. 
people can feel the strength of peace on your words if you have peace. But you've got to be a son of peace or a daughter of peace to speak peace. Otherwise, you're trying to give something you don't have. Now, the key here when peace speaks is a word that we use in understanding deliverance more effectively. Displacement. Deliverance is not just shouting at the darkness. It's not just casting out without any understanding of what's going. Displacement means the greater one now is, is taking up the place where that was. That's victory. Victory is displacement, is when that which is anointed takes the place of where something else had a habitation, where he was comfortable, had a house, had a place, had a foothold, as the scripture would say. We give no place to the devil. Displacement means the greater one comes into that place, the other thing flees. We've seen so much quality deliverance when people would close the door to the openings that are footholds that they've given to the devil. And they weren't puking in bags. They weren't rolling all over on the floor, although we've seen that. Matter of fact, that's how Jennifer and I met. Lady was rolling on the floor, Dennis ministered to her, and Jennifer, hmm, I thought that was about 10 years of counseling on the floor there. And it turned out to be moments, minutes. But that's neither here nor there. But what took place was displacement because the most powerful thing is a changed life. When she stood up, her countenance spoke volumes. You didn't need a sermon on theology of what just how she got delivered. You saw the result by the fruit you shall know them. If I don't see fruit, I don't care what you've been through, what kind of training, what kind of deliverance, what kind of uh, healing, counseling. If there's no countenance change, I, at best, the world has behavior modification. You know what that means? That means apart from God, you just quit doing that. I want to get paid to tell people. I'm going to counsel people and get paid to tell people, quit it. <laughs> Stop it. That'll be $10. Thank you. Now, this kingly anointing, just think you have the ability that when you have peace to speak peace, whether it's received or not, you create the atmosphere. Husbands and wives, uh, Jennifer learned this in, in her, uh, from her late husband, right? He was unsaved, Jennifer was saved, and she kept telling God on him, like, look what he's doing now, look what he's doing now, look what he's doing now, like, oh, look at that, God. And then she got the scripture, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies be at peace. When she quit pointing the finger at him and started to deal within herself, saying, my reaction, I am responsible for the way I'm reacting, and I'm going to react in a way that pleases God. Life changed dramatically. He was, she was like at this, she had this shield of peace that surpasses your understanding, and it does, and it's supposed to. <coughs> So displacement and that kingly anointing is found in Hebrews 7. To whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, then king of Salem, then king of peace. And I'm totally convinced that uh, Melchizedek was a Christophany and that he was, you don't pay your tithe to an earthly king. This is before the law, so Abraham paid tithes to a Christophany, which reading his history is interesting. Then you read in the Old Testament, there was the law, and they encouraged tithing. Then you got into the point of the Didache, which was taught by the 12 apostles of Jesus, and the Didache taught to tithe. Then in the New Testament, this is before the New Testament, then in the New Testament there is six illustrations of tithing and not one says don't do it. Not one. That, that has to be cleared up because there's crazy stuff going out uh, 
it's usually more of fear than anything, than theology, though. <clears throat> but God is basically saying he's the ruler. It's all his. You belong to God. You're under the government of God. You don't keep something. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? They decide to keep a little portion for themselves. Like, I'll be under the kingdom of God, but then there's my kingdom over here, too, that I got to take care of, that I'm general manager of. No, it all belongs to God, to whom your children belong to God. I can't believe people uh, 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 give silly, Christians even, silly arguments for abortion. That's, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. The scripture, you're supposed to be a Bible versed person, and the scripture says they're God's children. You've got no right. You can't ask my body. No, it's God's children. Romans 14, 4 in the Living Bible, we used to have little cards printed out to hand to people because we saw the same old, same old, same old mistakes. Romans 14, 4 in, in the Living Bible, this is good for parents too. They are God's servants, not yours. They belong to him, not to you. And God is able to tell them whether they're right or wrong, and God is able to make them do as they should. That could take some of the pressure out of parenting where you're pushing or pulling or demanding and start releasing love, peace, joy. Give them something they want and need. And let the, as Jennifer would say, let the oxytocin. Oxytocin is necessary for bonding. Some of your children don't bond with the parents, especially adopted children, really is very common. Because they, they have that unmet need for bonding at an early age. But I believe the beautiful thing about Jesus is he can take the most complicated situations and reparent you. Mm -hmm. The Apostle Paul saw himself as a mother and a father. He says, how, how I, in Thessalonians, how I ministered to you as a nursing mother and how I called forth those things out of you and taught you as a father with his children. See, there's both the comforting element and there's a pulling the gold out of them element. Now, all right, we're on 1G of 5, right? Everybody's going, oh, no, gee, oh, 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 oh. all right. But the government one to me is, is one of the most significant ones. So we understand this kingly anointing, this king of peace. He himself is our peace. So remember, when you look at peace, it's not an it. It's him. That, would, that could transform your Christian walk. Just recognizing that when you feel peace, and even for men who are not emotionally uh, as what, trained as women are, when you feel nothing, there's people that would give their life savings to feel nothing. They're on their heavy medication because nothing is a mysterious concept. So if you feel nothing and, it's, and you're a believer and that's the peace of God, you should be grateful and thankful that that means everything's in harmony, at least it's working the way it's supposed to work at this point, until I lose it. <laughs> but if I have it now, nothing, nothing is impossible with God. <laughs> All right, never mind. Scratch that part. But he himself is our peace. Now listen to this. Isaiah 52 talked about this. It says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. The one who's bringing good news, I would think he was talking about the words first, but he's talking about the feet first. He says, are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace. Oh, there it is, coming from the mouth. But he brings glad tidings. He proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. How beautiful are the feet. In other words, they need to be acted upon. Peace needs to be lived out. Peace needs to be walked out. Your life needs to be saying peace. Even if nobody's listening, your life should be speaking peace. And people, like I said, we had that, <clears throat> said that before. That, that girl in my first church, she was, a, she was just a ball of anxiety. She used to like to come and stand at the end of the service. We'd see people leaving, and she would stand there. 
things like that. I, just, I can feel peace just standing by you. And we have to teach her how to get it herself. But at the same time, it's a commodity that people want. People need it. And you have it. Are you going to keep it to yourself or are you going to express it? Be a blessing to other people. Now, I'm going to cover the other pieces. The other P, G words. All right? The other four. We know that the feet, <clears throat> we're told in Romans 10, that we're to preach this gospel of peace. George Whitfield, he said, the doctrines of the gospel are doctrines of peace, and they bring comfort to all who believe in them. They're not like the law given by Moses, which consisted of troublesome and painful ceremonies. Neither do they carry with them the terror which the law did. Cursed is everyone who continues and doesn't do everything in the law. If we were to keep the whole law and break one point, we're guilty of the breach. The law denounces threatening against all who do not conform to strict. But the gospel is a declaration of grace, peace, mercy. Here you have an account of the blood of Jesus, and the blood speaks of a better thing than that of Abel. Abel's blood cried out for vengeance. Jesus cries out for mercy upon the guilty sinner. To wash you clean, make you white as snow. I, when I led that little uh, girl to the Lord over in the Publix parking lot, I still remember <clears throat> how it touched me. Her husband was Buddhist, but she said, I said, ask Jesus to come in, cleanse you of your sin, and he will wash away all of your sin. She said, he will do that for me? Oh, I wanted to melt. He would do that? Yes. Yes, he wants to do that for the whole world, for whosoever will listen. Now, this, uh, I'm going to pray right now for an impartation of this before we get any further. This impartation, it says if, in Matthew 10, it says, if, if there's a household that's worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if not worthy, let your peace return to you. Which simply means you can't give something you don't have. But if you have it, give it. If they don't want to receive it, there's nothing you can do about it. But you don't change. Right? You offer it. Freely you received it, freely give it. So, Father, right now, we're just going to release it. This congregation and those watching by YouTube, Father, we've just released and impart peace is a reality to me, peace is a person to me, and I believe that impartation, you have to have it before you can impart it. So right now, to every open heart, you open your heart down in the gut, down in the belly, out of your belly flows rivers of living water, but that's also the place where you absorb. I want you to be a, a paper towel commercial today, to be a quicker picker-upper. I want you to be one who, who can absorb two to three times as much as normal. Right now, I've got it to give. You need to have it to receive. So right now, I open my heart and I receive that impartation that Dennis is releasing of the supernatural peace of God that rules. I'm going to walk in the newness of it. I'm absorbing it. I'm owning it. It's being written on the tablet of my heart and I'm not going anywhere without it I'm going to stay in that kingdom and that God country permanently and when I if I get out I'm going to get right back in instantly and go that's not God I'm getting back into it in Jesus name that should be your battle cry no ground to the devil no give him no place no foothold then you need to say that's not God when you hear something stupid in your head don't play with it don't analyze it don't even argue with it. What would you? Why? You're not going to win the argument anyway. The only way is to decree and declare the truth, and that is that's not God. And it loses its power. You give power to what you give attention to, and you might think you're being very clever figuring it out, but you're giving power to it, and it's going to beat you up. You thinketh too much. <laughs> King James Version. You thinketh too much. All right. Now, this covenant of peace that God wants to, that we've just believed for imparting, uh, if you're deserving, it'll come upon you. The freedom from distresses that you experience as a result, it, I'm believing it's going forth and it's going to accomplish threefold peace, increase. This covenant of peace is for your home, it's for the cities. When I came down here, with minimal instruction from God. He said, the city in which you've been taken captive, meaning the Charlotte region, the city in which you've been taken captive, pray for its peace, for in it will be your peace. And I'll tell you what, I saw one miracle after another of God taking care of me, coming down here, 
like it felt like Abraham in a strange, going into a strange country, knowing nobody, and God took care of me better than I've ever been taken care of in my life. But that was because I prayed for that peace. I'm here. I'm obedient to you. I came here. I don't have the answers. But that peace, his provision, I mean, somebody, a total stranger, gave me rent-free, well, a dollar, to live and a furnished appointment on Lake Wiley. And she just cried because she said, God spoke in an audible voice and said, do something for this man. That's the kind of peace that we serve. That's the God of peace. And he wants that peace to rule over our decisions, over our troubling circumstances, distractions. He wants us to get to the place of self-governance. Whoever has no rule over his spirit, there it is again, is what? Like a city broken down, the enemy could just run roughshod over you. All right. Now we're going to cover rather quickly. Once you've got the government, you've got everything, though. Once you've got government. Plus, to me, the apostolic approach appeals to me because it lays the foundation. And it has contact with all the other aspects of it. You get that part done. You get the government down. You get to govern. And I'll tell you what, you won't have any trouble with the guide, the guard, the ground, the go forward. The other G's will come a lot easier. But let's cover the other G's. The second one is the prophetic guide. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, God says in Psalm 40, verse 6. You delight in them but you've given me a capacity to hear and obey. That's what he's looking for. <clears throat> he wants to guide you by the government of voice. He wants to guide you into all truth. What he hears, he will speak. That's what Jesus said. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he's going to guide you into all truth. He's not going to speak on his own authority. But if it's not scriptural, you got to say, that's not God. But God will speak truth and guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own authority, but what he hears, he speaks. You can trust the Holy Spirit. But how are you going to trust the Holy Spirit when you hear multiple voices? If you don't have peace, I don't trust any of those voices. I don't know if they're coming from the world, the flesh, and the devil. You see, it's not the voice. It's the authority attached with the voice. If you can't identify what power is behind the voice, how are you going to know the source? How are you going to know what to listen to and what not to listen to? Authority, authority, authority has to be the lordship of peace and the rule of peace. When peace rules, you will be able to discern if that voice is coming from the world, the flesh, or the devil. And quickly say, that's not me. That's not God. Now, so the prophet guides, and this is the way he works. <coughs> The evangelist, it says, Hebrews 12, 14, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. What God is saying is that you want to be a real evangelist, by the way, it's not you preaching the gospel as much as understanding what that gospel consists of. Go into all the world, preach the remission of sin. You want to preach the gospel, you better preach forgiveness. You better preach forgiveness. You want to you see the evangelistic part of the G's, the go and gather? You preach forgiveness. Forgiveness is the love message. Do you believe in preaching the love message? Love God and love one another. You go preach the love message, Forgiveness is where the rubber meets the road. Anybody can go, love, love, love. I love my car. I love my dog. I love my house. But when you walk in a lifestyle of forgiveness and cleansing, you're walking in the love message where the rubber meets the road. Now you're not playing church. You're walking in the reality of the love of God. And you'll have, how do I know if I did it right? Peace. There you go. No peace. You, did, you gave lip service to something, but you didn't do it right. That's the evangelist. So what's the prophet do? He guides you into all truth. He needs to be the source behind the words. 
It needs to be the authority behind the words. The government and the and the the, uh, the apostle and the prophet, the government and the guidance. The next thing you know is you need to get that out of you and go preach it. Go preach it. That's the evangelist toward the body of Christ, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. That's what we've got here on Tuesday nights. Hmm? The bond of peace means it's a knitting that only the Holy Spirit can do. And when it brings peace, it's because you're in one accord. You're like-minded. As a matter of fact, uh, Philippians 2.2 and 2 the expanded. Let me have my phone for a minute. I, I came across this and I said, this is Kingdom Life Church. This should be everybody individually and corporately. And it was... Uh, Now, if I can make this big enough, that I can read it. It's Philippians 2, 1 and 2, roughly, in the expanded translations. Philippians 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, therefore, does your life, Christ, give you strength? Is there any encouragement in Christ? Does, is there any love or comfort for you? In my comfort for his love, do we share together in the Spirit? Is there any fellowship sharing in the Spirit? Do you have mercy and kindness? Is there any mercy and affection, kindness and compassion? Make me very happy. Oh, Apostle Paul wanted to be made happy. Make me happy. And how does he do that? Make me very happy. Completing my joy by having the same thoughts, being the same minded, one mind, sharing the same love, Having one mind, one heart, one soul, one purpose, one mind, one goal. I know that's the expand. It's kind of like the Amplify. But what he's saying is it's got to be real this way. It's not about just showing up. And quite frankly, the Lord's been giving me a word, and I want to give this word publicly too for those that watch by YouTube. There's way more are watching by YouTube than are in this room. But God made it very, <clears throat> very clear. You're seeing people come and go sometimes in any church. That, that's there's always movement. But I'll tell you, the ones that are that that are not going to something, they're running from something. You know what they're running from? Intimacy. Fear of intimacy. We have a booklet on codependency and counterdependency. Be good to good to read that. Because it's, it's really understanding that when you have fear of intimacy, you find, you find a substitute to either control or be consumed by, to meet an unmet need that only intimacy with Jesus can solve. Anything else is a, is a substitute. It's a, bro it's a cistern. It doesn't hold any water. So, Father, I'm praying right now that, that there's going to be a move of the Holy Spirit on people who have been notoriously afraid of intimacy and have found substitutes. That in Jesus' name right now, we reveal that the intimacy with Jesus is the strongest, most wonderful thing that's ever been placed on planet Earth, given that opportunity. Cut through the barriers even this day. Speak to them in a way that, that they understand, significantly releasing that hunger and that thirst for intimacy with God at a deeper level. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So that's the evangelist, the pastor. Let the peace of God guard your heart and your mind. What's the Holy Spirit doing with that G? Guard. He's guarding your heart and your mind. If I've got peace guarding my heart and my mind, and someone comes and is totally demonic, and, and well, even like we did with the halfway house story. And you've heard that in the last two messages. I worked at a halfway house. A guy pulled a knife. And the peace of God increased. Increased. I wouldn't tell someone to do something foolish. I'm telling you, I know what I know by the peace of God. And that reality is something you need to know for yourself. Next thing you know, he, that knife, his hand shook. He dropped the knife, dropped to his knees cried, and they gave him his medication. 
but the supernatural peace of God will guard your heart and your mind. If it'll guard in that kind of a situation, how, how much more would it guard in the everyday routine of life? Give me a break. Are you even trying? Because that's the next step. The, the teacher grounds. So the pastor guards. The peace of God will guard your heart and your mind, but the teacher grounds it. And what that means, practice makes permanent. Are you even attempting? When we traveled, we saw people get powerful. We're, we're in a church for a very short period of time, and God moved quickly. But guess who he moved with? The hungry ones. He moved with the ones who, if we gave a, said, look, we don't have time to do 12 appointments, but we can do four appointments. Uh, here, uh, get prepared, uh, read this, or look at this. Something simple. I mean simple. And more often than not, oh, I didn't do it. I didn't have time. Those are the people that got bypassed and worked with the people who really wanted to do something about their life. Like the woman, it's a miracle. I got a babysitter for my kids. I had to take a ferry off the island, and then I had to drive two and a half hours. She walks in the door, and bam, power of God hit her. You know, there's something to be said about effort when it's the rightly applied effort. Not soulish dead works but rightly applied effort. You give power to what you give attention to. So Father, we just thank you right now that we're going to get grounded in the days ahead. These things I spoke to you that you in, in them you might have peace. The Apostle Paul said, I'm speaking these things to you so that there's an impartation of not just mere information, but that you would have peace. I want you to walk in the supernatural realm of the kingdom. And why, why do we not hear more about love of God? Because the church is real good on a lot of things. Love's not one of them. Huh? Then let's start practicing the harder, truer message of the gospel of the kingdom, and that's love, joy, peace. If you don't have any of that, you need ministry. The teacher groans, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives you. He's given it to you, and he's never taken it away, and it's there forever. That covenant of peace he's given forever. So you can instantly get back there, but you instantly know that this is forever. I'm staying in God country. So, so Father, the apostle governs. Let the peace of God rule. The prophet guides. Uh, he will not speak on his own authority. He'll guide you into all truth. Uh, no decision without, don't make decisions without peace. Practice that peace in a daily way. The evangelist, uh, saved or unsaved, I'm living a forgiveness lifestyle. Not just for once in a while, a forgiveness lifestyle. And that's going to be the evangelist in me by the power of the Spirit. The pastor that guards, like a shepherd that seeks out its flock on a day that is among scattered sheep, I'm going to seek out my sheep and deliver them from the places where they were scattered on a cloudy day. You cannot deliver somebody from where they've been scattered unless they want to. You can't make them do anything. But you can be available and willing. This church is willing to help the whosoever's. I'll mentor people in this church. We're small enough. This is easy. I'll mentor somebody, but by golly, I want to see you actually do the work. The pastor guards your hearts and your minds. The God of peace will crush Satan beneath your feet. And the only legitimate wall in your life is peace. So if you see someone that actually hates you and you get peace and that person says evil stuff, it can't enter the peace of God. It'll bounce off of it. You cannot penetrate the fruit of the Spirit with the world, the flesh, or the devil. It cannot penetrate. But you've got to learn to live there. Otherwise, you're like a city broken down. Anything, anything anybody says, oh, I'm wounded, I'm rejected, I got hurt in the church. You know, that is about the, one of the poorest excuses I ever heard. That's the only place you're going to get healed. Isn't that the perfect strategy to say, I got hurt in the church? I mean, that ain't God. But there's a perfect strategy. But the beautiful part is God says, I can restore that which is lost. A dimly burning wick, I don't snuff it out. I will breathe on it, that breath of life, and I can do, I can do in a week 
what they couldn't do in 10 years. So God is a God of restoration and God of healing. But it's to practice, practice, practice. So Father, we pray right now that uh, to get grounded in this, we're going to practice in the days ahead. And July and August, we're going to practice a 60-day peace challenge. Not the 60-day challenge, the 60-day peace challenge. So deal with your emotional stuff and make it a lot better. It's hard to have peace when you have issues. This church, we had a, we had a, a clear clarion call when we started this church. They say, well, what are you about? What do you teach? What's your emphasis? We die to our agendas and deal with our issues. <laughs> you don't need any more than that. If you would die to an agenda means something that's not God. It's just something that's your good idea. Die to an agenda and deal with your issues. You'll grow graciously quickly. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to Drs. Dennis Clark and Jennifer Clark from Full Stature Ministries. To explore more life-transforming resources and deepen your faith journey, please visit us at forgive123.com and our online school at teamembassy.com. All rights reserved under applicable law. For details, please see our copyright policy on our website. Again, that's forgive123.com.